please introduce yourself. I'm Christopher Hendon. I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Oregon. You, you've kind of been focused, I guess, on coffee a little bit more for a little while. Why? Early on when I was learning about coffee, I didn't realize that there was a, a market or a desire for more science in the industry. And after Water for Coffee, we realized that there was many contributions that both myself and my students could make. And then when the funding became available so that there was actually other people interested besides me, that was a real driving force for going after, I'd say, large scale or important problems. The last paper seemed to go pretty wide. It did. Uh, <laughs> does, that, does that help? Is that... So um, people like reading about things that are not coronavirus. Um, <laughs> That's true. In 20, that paper came out in March of 2020. And uh, that was also right about the time when things were going pretty south for the world. And I think it was a bit of a break from the bad news that was happening. So that's part of the reason. People are fascinated with espresso and really we don't understand all that much on the scientific level, but we definitely know how to make pretty tasty drinks. And so that's, a, that's an in interesting problem for science. This paper, I'm curious of all the topics you could have picked. Coffee's broad. Even espresso brewing is a pretty broad thing. You picked a surprisingly niche kind of practice in the industry to study, and I'm curious why. There's a short backstory to this. My coffee lab is public, and so we do our experiments and we give away the coffee, and this is not our primary focus of what the lab is pursuing. But because of that public-facing side of things, it attracts people from other departments in the university to frequent. And they, volcanologists one day were coming through and saw that we were having a particle charging problem, the static electricity that everyone's familiar with when you grind coffee, and realized that this is another application for their science as well. In short, we started to collaborate because they had an interest in this idea of triboelectrification or, or particle charging. And I had a problem that we were facing with brewing reproducible espresso in the lab. And so together we realized that this charging of particles was leading to variation between espresso shots. And this I would say is largely a side project that became a important contribution, perhaps in coffee, but certainly in fundamental materials science. In the simplest way you feel comfortable, mm -hmm. describe how coffee is being charged when you break it into little pieces. So all materials charge when you rub them on the same material or other materials. The mechanism of that is basically you can think about it as interfacial heating. Mm -hmm. uh, coffee is no different to other materials in the sense that you're going to rub and break it during the grinding process. And doing that, you're going to create a fair amount of interfacial heat. And so as a result, you're going to get static electricity generated throughout that the grind. And the, what you're observing then after it exits the grind chamber is small particles ranging from, I don't know, let's say one micron to a thousand micron that are carrying positive and negative charges. It's effectively when it's being tumbled around in there, it's like rubbing the balloon on the jumper on the hair, right? Like it's the same it, thing. Right, that's right. So it's also an, an extra effect of breaking. So this idea of fracturing or fracto electrification is sort of an added example of how you might get interfacial heating and then charging. So if you ground, let's say, uh, more uniformly and you had less fines, there'd be less pieces broken, you would have less charging. If the fewer the cracks, yeah. the less charging you're going to have. So a, a kind of uniform coarse grind compared to a right. classic espresso grind would have a very different amount of charge. One of the challenges with this is that it depends on where you observe the charge. So if you grind really coarse, you'll see that there's not all that much charge because you haven't fractured the coffee very much. If you grind really fine, you'll also observe perhaps not all that much charge because the particles will stick together and clump. So when they fall out of the grind chamber, they're already seemingly neutral, but that's because they've already, you know, de-electrified by interacting with one another. By the way, that fine level is way finer than you can grind for espresso. Okay. Yeah, it's very fine. It's kind of like Turkish, Turkish fine or fine Even uh... there and beyond. Okay. There was one example in the paper where we showed that the finest grind setting was actually less charged than the second finest grind setting that we used. And that was an example of particles clumping before we measured them. 
Okay. But the net, the overall charge was much, much higher before they clumped. Gotcha. They just neutralized and right. sort of canceled out the charge. And that's kind of the, the thing, which is one of the interesting things from the paper is that uh, charges, the charge is kind of predictable, but not that predictable. And right. So you, you would expect different roast levels to charge differently or different aspects of coffee particles to charge differently, right? Right. So darker roasts typically charge more and more negatively than lighter roasts. That's that right. fair to say? Yes. And chaff always charges positively. Seemingly so. Every time. Is there a reason? Would you know why? The charging of materials depends on the composition of the material. Okay. And the chaff is compositionally dissimilar to that of roasted coffee. Why that? Why they charge differently is still not really understood. Certainly not in my lab, but perhaps others know. You would speculate that the primary difference between the light roast and the dark roast, more than say density, is going to be moisture content. Yes. And the example that we gave in the paper was by sourcing all these different coffees from roasters around the world, roasted to different colors and to different internal moisture content. And there's a nonlinear relate. I mean, there's no trend seemingly besides that really dark coffees charge negatively. And otherwise, it looks like a throwing darts at a dartboard. And that's because it's not, ex- it's not only coffee composition, in other words, color. It's also moisture. And they probably interact with each other because they're how you achieve a light roast. You know how how one roaster may achieve a light roast may be very different to how another roaster does. Is there a correlation? This is slightly difficult to ask, but roast is one thing. What about coffee quality? That's a good question. I typically work in the specialty mm-hmm. side of the industry. Um, in the paper, though, we did include some commodity grade coffees. Uh, those commodity grade coffees also coincidentally were roasted much darker. Those ones charged highly negatively, uh, and we don't really apply a preference to our coffees when we're selecting them for an experiment. But I can say that at the specialty level, typically, typically roasters tend to roast much lighter, so they fall in this category of being at that tipping point between charging positive and charging negative, and. It wasn't really related necessarily to the quality, but more to the roast. Quality in coffee is a difficult thing to talk about because the word in English means multiple things. There's a characteristic quality, and then there's absolute quality. In other words, monetary, that carries monetary value. Yeah. The, I think the scientific consensus, at least at this point, is that the difference between a high-quality coffee in the sense that it has desirable characteristics and a low quality one is really, there's not that much difference there compositionally. It's minor fluctuations and perhaps increased content of some molecules you like and decreased content of other ones that you don't. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's all these other green coffee things like defects and all the other stuff, right? But the ignoring that, if you hand sorted coffee and you made sure there was no potato defect and no lady bird tain, all that stuff that you would in principle get something that's really actually not that composition compositionally dissimilar. So we didn't really select for that. Yep. But perhaps we should do the follow ex- up experiment. I don't really know how I'd write about that because sorting coffees into high quality and low quality is not that's something that's very difficult to do without coming across as having an opinion. Yes. And we're trying to avoid having it an it's opinion. Like how you bring an aesthetic opinion into a test right. like this is tricky. Right. It's fair. I mean, I was just curious if ultimately we, we talk about a, the size of a particle, let's say. Yeah. But if that particle is comparatively less dense through <clears throat> both initial green coffee composition and roast composition together, yeah. that'll be substantially less dense at, let's say, 30 microns yeah. than a light roasted particle of the same size. Sure. To that point, actually, one of the... Ex- I need to make a, a clerical correction to, uh, in 2016, we wrote a paper that was published in Scientific Reports that was the paper that nucleated the idea of freezing coffee and then grinding whilst cold. In that paper, I made the case that the four coffees we worked with were all producing the same particle size distribution, independent of roast uh, or origin, etc. We have now gone back and redone that because we've worked with many more coffees in this publication. And it is absolutely true that the darker the coffee, the finer the particle size for a given fixed grind setting to a point where actually you shift, let's say somewhere between what I like a French roast, a quite dark roast and something much lighter that you find a typical specialty roaster. Mm -hmm. 
their average particle size can shift 100 micron. Now, is that because that's difficult to talk about, like an average particle size is, I, is, I know. is a, is a I know. complex thing. But are you, ultimately, the speculation has always been when you have a very brittle structure, it shatters and, and splinters differently. It could be that. And so your kind of um, median particle size is probably the same, but your distribution of like, the, this is just the change of the distribution of fines, which drags your average that way. Yeah, that's so... I need to look back on the paper, but I think we were measuring the bol the boulder size. Okay, interesting. The center of the boulder's peak. So early on, we said that I thought they all ground the same. In this paper, we now have a figure that clearly says we that that is not right, which is part of science. That's the just more more data. Right? I it, I'd rather it be me that tells me I'm wrong than someone else. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Okay, back to back to this paper. Right. So you were studying water. Uh, which was the thing that people have started doing at home, a little spray of water on the beans, because it seems to work. Could you speculate as to why it works? So water is a a very good dielectric medium in the sense that it is polar. So the oxygen in water is negatively charged and hydrogens are positively charged, meaning that they can interact with things that are of opposite charges to either of those atoms. And as a result, uh, water is very good at mitigating charging of solutions, uh, evidently during grinding as well. But water also has other properties that are useful for mitigating static accumulation. It's, it's very, very good at dissipating heat. And the amount of charge does depend on how high a temperature you go. And so as a result, having water around probably serves multiple roles. On one hand, it's probably changing the surface chemistry of the coffee and also of the burrs. It's probably also cooling the burrs and also cooling the coffee. It's probably acting as a sort of an interfacial barrier between any charge that's forming, maybe going into the water rather than accumulating on the coffee, and perhaps other effects as well. Now, historically, we've used water from a mess perspective. Right, like it was there to mitigate the mess of right. grinding coffee because static caused just coffee particles to go everywhere. Recently, we've seen a different approach come out, which are ionizers, which are added to grinders. Right. What exactly is an ionizer doing, and and how does it compare to water? An ionizer is basically an electrical device that, when you apply a high voltage, it's going to emit positive or negative charges that can then bombard a particle or a material falling past the ion beam. Uh, these ionizers typically have a positive and a negative side to them, and you're going to point the whatever polarity you're aiming for towards something you want to, in principle, de-electrify. In the coffee environment, you're going to point the negative side of the ionizer, in principle, right. positively charging coffee, okay. and you're going to neutralize that charge by bombarding it with negative ions. The problem with that is, is that the de-electrification step there has occurred after the particles have exited the grind chamber and have flown through the chute of your grinder or whatever. And during that time where the coffee is charging whilst grinding and then exiting and falling, the small particles and large particles, which may have opposite charges, do have time to finding each other and form an aggregate. These clumps then are seemingly charge neutral or close to that, which means that your ion beam is not going to break apart those clumps. It's just going to minimize charge of other particles that may be charged. This is different to water because water is introduced at the point where the charging is occurring. And so as a result, you don't form the clumps because you never formed the charge. And so you end up with a net difference in particle size distribution because the ion beams will still yield these aggregates, but also then minimize any extra charge. So it makes it aesthetically look like it's cleaner, but you don't get the benefit of blowing apart those aggregates. And so you still have a relatively inhomogeneous grind distribution. Water, on the other hand, fixes that. Before we get into into mm -hmm. the impact on brewing, I do want to kind of talk about thresholds here because sure. most people making coffee at home will add, let's say, a spray of water from an atomizer onto their coffee beans and use that and see a nice result. You know, you don't get the mess, you don't get the static. Right. But it seems that there is a relationship between how much water you apply and the kind of level of mitigation of charge. Right. There is definitely a relationship between the amount of water that you add and the amount of charging that occurs. And typically we talk about it in the amount of water that you have to add per gram of coffee that you're grinding. Uh, the tipping point 
for where you start to really see this de-electrification occurring is in the vicinity of, let's say, 10 microliters per gram of coffee and above, which is a fair bit more water than you introduce typically with one squirt from one of these atomizing bottles that are pretty common in the industry. We think the reason for that is, is that a lot of this water that you're introducing with one of those squirt bottles ends up not really on the coffee, but on the vessel that it's on and so forth. And so when we do these experiments, we're using a, a micro pipette and adding it directly to the, the beans and then trying to distribute the best we can. Um, but there, it could be an element of some of that water is not actually making its way onto the coffee, but it's also, you're not introducing that much. There is a tipping point where you've added too much water as well, but I think that's that's sort of more obvious. At some point, you're you're going to have a very wet grind. But we're talking here in let's say an 18 gram dose, mm -hmm. where we, we we might have up to 0.1 of a gram added from a spray. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at going from one spray to three, four, five, right? To kind of get into that vicinity of 20 microliters per gram, which is the kind of sweet spot from looking at it. Right. That's right. It's a fair bit more water than perhaps people are familiar with or used to. Um, but in our hands, we don't see water accumulation in the grinder. In fact, we see nothing accumulate in the grinder. Uh, that's one of the sort of added benefits that we observed that we didn't really write about in the paper, but the grind retention, the grind retention in a flat burr architecture goes basically to zero. That's probably because you've de-electrified the entire grind chamber, so nothing's gonna stick to it anymore and everything falls out. But the, the upside of that is tremendous because then you don't have stale coffee from an earlier grind making its way into your next shot, number one. Number two, you also then can really dose 18 grams before you grind, and then out you grind and out comes 18 grams. So you don't have this problem of having to reweigh every shot that you make, etc. I think people's bigger concern about <clears throat> beyond retaining coffee inside the grinder is going to be retaining moisture inside the grinder. Because once you start feeling like you're spraying, 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 let's say I make three, four shots back to back, and I've added in what feels like a gram of water or two grams of water at this point to my coffee beans. Right. That's an expensive bit of kit on my counter. I can't help but freak out that I'm starting to put water into a coffee grinder, which seems like a thing you shouldn't be doing. Yes. <laughs> Although I, we don't really know. If you're going to dial in multiple shots in the morning, you're probably going to go through, I don't know, four or five attempts before you arrive at something that's good unless your coffee or you are very consistent. In our hands, we didn't see a moisture accumulation in our grinder. We did see a change in internal humidity in the grind chamber, but that return to equilibrium, which on the day that we did this was 40%, very rapidly, uh, you know, in, the, in a matter of, let's say, time frame of a minute rather than waiting a long time because there's drips of water in there. In an industrial setting, no one's really done this on large scale. Uh, that I'm aware of. So we're going to have to wait and see how that this pans out for the large scale, like a cafe setting, perhaps even larger than that for some of the big time producers of extracts. Right. I will say, however, that we also thought originally that grinding frozen coffee was going to be a problem for our coffee grinders, and we haven't seen any real problem with that. This may prove to be the same, that a small amount of water may dissipate rapidly and we'll never really see an issue. But if there is some problems with corrosion or whatever, there's also other coatings that you might then choose to use on burrs and the grind chamber as well that would be able to withstand exposure to water. I think the reason that we choose the current burr architectures and composition is because we're dialing in our technology to grind coffee. Right. Not to grind coffee and water. Yes. Talking of coatings, the coatings would play a role in the triboelectrification, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. And so is there a kind of perfect coating that is great for reducing that particular form of electrification <clears throat> and also really doesn't care about water and wouldn't have, you know, and has great results in terms of longevity and, and cup quality? Like, is there, a, is there a better coating? If the coffee charges negatively, then you're better off with a grinder that is more more wants to charge itself more negatively okay ceramic for example okay if it charges more positively then you want to go for a, a totally different burr composition so you don't really have a uniform answer here because it depends on the coffee not so much the the burrs because the if the burrs are a fixed material then the amount that they charge 
will de- themselves will depend on whatever you contact them with. Right. It's a two-way street, right? The electrification is not just the metal is giving away charges, it's also accumulating them. In a weird sort of way, if you think about like configuring like cut, burr size, all that kind of stuff, materials <clears throat> coating almost needs to be dialed in per coffee in a way or per roast level to be to, to kind of gain the greatest benefit in terms of mitigating charge accumulation. I'll answer your your question with an example. If there was one best coating, then manufacturers would not have 10 different coatings for one you know, burr set that's of different angles and whatnot. But I've never seen a manufacturer reference static accumulation and a coating. So I don't even know if well, that, that presumes they're thinking about it. And I'm never confident manufacturers are thinking about this stuff. The burr composition and coating matters a lot in terms of charging the coffee. But it doesn't matter as much as the coffee itself. Okay. That's a good that's a good takeaway from that. So now I want to get into the bit that is the buried lead in this one. As I was reading the paper, I was not being like, so what? I was like, interesting, interesting, interesting. And then you drop this piece in, which is ultimately adding enough water makes better espresso. Yes. And that's a that's a big thing to just kind of drop in. And I find it kind of fascinating in that we all missed it. We've been doing this forever, not forever, we've been doing this for years at a level where we've seen some benefit, but then you went and looked and found the real benefit of this, which was, I would say better espresso, I don't know how you would define it, probably slower flow, higher extraction, which I would call better espresso. When you grind coffee without water, just a conventional way of grinding coffee, you produce fines and boulders, depending on the grind setting, and when they exit the grind chamber, they do have time to combine with one another to make an aggregate or a mega particle or whatever you want to think of it as. Yeah. If you don't blow those aggregates apart and then you directly go and put them in a portafilter and tamp, you're going to end up with a bed density which is it's less dense than if you were to have had those particles separate from one another. So as a result, there's more void space in there. And then there are regions of much higher density, so it's really an inhomogeneous bed. If you then add water during the grind process, you're going to make the fines and the boulders uh, separate from one another. They're never going to have combined in the first place. They're not going to change in size all that much. They're just not going to ever form that aggregate. So as a result, when you go ahead and tamp, you end up with a more dense bed that has less void space contained within. Which would then lead to more channeling, ultimately, or a more uneven flow? The uneven flow is if you have more void space. Right. As in, yeah, so if you have dry coffee equals less even flow. That's right. Because you have much higher void space in some regions, and then in other regions in the bed, you're going to have these mega particles, which are very dense. So as a result, you have less accessible surface area. An espresso format really highlights this problem because you are relying on the water to penetrate the coffee and then the coffee material to exit back into the water in the time frame between, let's say, 10 and 50 seconds, yep. which is very fast. But saying that, would you anticipate the same benefits in drip coffee? If the brew format is one that is full immersion, then those particle aggregates should be blown apart. If it is a pour over format, I would expect that there would still be some observed effect. Okay, so percolation remains the kind of problem area. It is, yeah. And espresso is just, you know, high pressure, high temperature percolation. So to your actual question, yes, <clears throat> was about this idea of why did I not lead yeah. the paper of talking about espresso? There are some unanswered questions with the data that I did present. So if you just keep the grind setting the same and the only variable you're changing is whether or not you ground with water, you definitely see the shot time increase, you see the flow rate decrease, and as a result, you end up with higher extraction yields by a lot. So it's like 10% higher, which is in principle good, uh, as long as it still tastes good. Right. The experiment that we did not do or did not present is, well, what if you then adjust the grind setting so that the flow rates are the same? You can match, you could basically grind coarser and achieve the same, more or less the same flow rate as if you had not squirted water on the coffee. Do you get a higher extraction yield then? I would presume not. Maybe. Do you? Have you done, the, have you done this yet? Someone should do the experiment. Someone should do this experiment. But it, basically, if you dial it back so the flow rate is the same, I'm... Someone might, it may come, it may be true that actually you get exactly the same extraction yields. 
But you would expect with a reduced surface area <clears throat> some reduction. So there'd be a different flavor profile. Right, for and the matching extraction. Right. In our 2020 paper, I argued for going fast. Yes. Because we couldn't grind fine enough without getting into the, the inhomogeneous region. Yeah, I've, well, I feel like you, you, you advocated for even that happened to be fast rather than advocating to fast. Right. Fast. With water, yep. we can now go slow and even. Right. So this allowed us to go to the part of the volcano that we could not get to previously. I'm curious, and I don't know if you've done the, the math on this, I would presume you need more water added to darker roasts to have the same effect because there's more uh, energy or static to mitigate, right? Like We did that experiment. Uh, the answer is no. It, the amount of water seems to... The dark roast de-electrifies more quickly with the addition of water, but they all seem to converge at about 20 microliters per gram. They're all getting pretty close to zero. Interesting. So... Lighter roasts almost need more moisture per level of charge to get back to zero, in a way. Yeah. Because uh, they are less charged. They're typically positively charged and not that charged compared to the most charged negative particles in very dark roasts. Right, right, right. So they have a shorter distance to go on the little chart yeah. to zero, <laughs> but they need more water to do it. So if the light roast has more internal water before you ground it, mm -hmm. then the percentage of water that you've added is less. Right. So I think it's actually about the the difference in the amount of water it had versus how much you added. Yes. Which is a tricky thing to think about. So I don't actually have the I don't have the math done in my head on it. So we could do the math. But okay. It just crossed my mind of like what is that you know, do I need to act as a home user? Do I suddenly have this recommendation of 20 microliters per gram for everything or am I like trying to dial in a little bit more to what I need. I would say for the home user, the doing one squirt is going to aesthetically cause less mess, mm -hmm. making cleaning up better, It's which is already a success. Um, you're also going to probably get the benefit of having less retention in your grinder, which is also good. Uh, it's not doing the full job of de-electrifying as much as it could. Less than 50 microliters per gram is also, well, that's the upper limit. Right. 50 microliters per gram is the upper limit. And that's where you start to get different sort of clumps forming. You do. You get wet clumps. Right. Yeah. Which is, whether or not that's good is something else. What do you think the consequences of this paper will be? And what does the future sort of look like as a result of this work? The consequences of this paper are twofold. So in the material science industry, my field that I'm usually working in, most of the time people do not think about adding external solvents or other materials while you're electrifying in that area, outside of the domain of coffee, this is a novel contribution because it suggests that there are ways that you could process sand for concrete, process coffee, of course, think about pulping wood for making paper, these sorts of things. This will have an impact in that area. We don't really know the extent to which grinding or shaving or whatever, any electrification process um, will be affected by water for other materials. But then focusing on the coffee industry, this is a weird paper for us because it is a very microscopic thing that we've addressed. Squirt a little bit of water on, on the particles or on the beans, I should say, and then grind them. But the impact could be, oh, we've achieved more reproducible espresso, higher extraction yields, which goes to a big problem in the industry of sustainability, mm -hmm. which also has two meanings in the coffee industry. Because if I use less coffee here, then I buy less coffee from the producer, which is less sustainable overall. But if I use too much coffee here, then there won't be any coffee from the producer, which is less sustainable overall. So what the real goal then, Mac, zooming way out, is can we use the coffee we have purchased in a way that pushes quality up so that the demand for that product increases? And I think we have definitely made a step towards that in this paper. Because if you can achieve more reproducible, high quality extractions, you're going to have less experience of that negative shot that makes someone never go to your cafe again. Right. You're gonna have a better time in the morning when you buy that bag from your local roaster and you don't take five shots to dial it in, you take two. These are small things that affect a tremendous number of people as opposed to the you know, the, a big picture problem that affects a very small but expensive market. This, so it's sort of a, this is science for the people, if you like. Right. 
I, I'm pro anything that's going to make the worst better. In a it definitely way. makes that, the worst that, better. That remains the focus for me, and specialty's obsessed with making the best better, and I, and I think some of us remain obsessed with making the worst better, mm -hmm. because there's the much bigger win. Like, coffee's amazing right now. Yeah, it's really good. It's also terrible, often. And, and yep. that's, that's a bigger problem to me than the amazing is not amazing enough. Elevating the floor is a really important thing for any specialty market, not only coffee. Uh, this is just another example of that that happens to be rooted in material science. This paper you kind of mentioned was almost like a diversion on a journey. This was not what the funding was allocated to. Right. Does this paper have consequences for what you were or are working on? Right. So my laboratory is interested in developing a measurement method that allows you to diagnose qualities, in other words, the existence of a molecule and how much of it there is, in extracts of coffee. And in order to do that, you need to be confident that you're achieving reproducible espresso shots. We need, we need to have extracts that are the same so that we can say when we make a measurement on them, they are indeed the same. And without de-electrifying, we were finding very large variance between shots that were seemingly identical. For example, you could have the same number of grams of coffee dry mass. You could have the same mass of water that passes through the coffee in the same amount of time, same flow rate, same everything, and you'd arrive at shots that tasted wildly different. Historically, we've kind of used TDS as a proxy for quality. And in fact, here we talk about an increase in TDS, therefore an increase in extraction, and therefore the implication is an increase in quality. Here, you're, you're looking at another measurable that you could correlate to quality. That's right. So my lab is looking at fractions of that TDS. What families of molecules are giving rise to the flavor experience that you're having? And the challenge that we were facing and why we ended up de-electrifying coffee while grinding was that these aggregates that are forming result in very... Uh, I should say, highly variable shots of espresso. In the 2020 paper that we published about making fast espresso, mm -hmm. one of the challenges was we couldn't grind fine enough and achieve high extractions because we had aggregates forming, we were channeling, whatever. We are now able to grind fine enough and achieve the extractions that our model was predicting. And so this was filling in a portion that we knew was erroneous in our previous experiments. So in that, that sense, this is a success for us because it allows more particle size distribu distributions to be accessible. So it's a little abstract to think about when the paper will be published because uh, we have to finish writing it. That's fine. I can handle that. How long it takes in peer review? Because this is a big deal. Like This is <clears throat> a huge deal theoretically if we can sort of have a measurable of quality that isn't a fleshy meat bag tasting it and being like, this is good. Right, and we're trying to focus on the, the industry side of this, which is needs to be fast, it needs to be cheap, it needs to be in real time, so, and it needs to map onto something real. The problem I've always had with the extraction yield and, and TDS as a measurement is that every person who's ever used that, that type of measurement knows that you can have a 22% extraction yield at 1.4% uh, TDS for a filter coffee and it can taste superb and exactly the same coffee you can have a truly terrible experience same metrics it's because you're looking at a summary and not a composition right and how how you can make the measurement of composition is really what we've been driving towards it's a totally new approach because obviously if it was not new it would have already been done and so it's taken us quite some time to get to this stage to answer your question, yeah, we're going to be, you're going to read about that one in a year. Okay. If we can achieve everything that we've been aiming for in that project, this will be the biggest thing I've contributed to this industry. That's exciting. And you mentioned we may see it a little sooner than that? You will. So yeah. you'll see it on the competition stage, hopefully. Uh, again, I can't control how that goes. Right. Um, you're going to see me talking about it. In fact, there's already recordings of it. You know, so it's not, a, it's not a secret, but I'm just trying to stay on track here. So the summary of this is that we can make compositional measurements and back out how much of a family of molecules exist in a given extract. 
and we can do it dynamically. So we can do it during the shot. We can do it after the shot. Uh, so there's a tremendous upside to this because you can imagine any number of technologies that would care about this, not just our mouths, right? Of course. To do it dynamically in a shot, you would be talking an incredibly fast measurement. The measurement's less than one millisecond. Okay, which is a little quicker than, than repeatedly hitting measure on a TDS meter. Yeah, and it randomly generating until numbers. It, it, you know, yeah. until it settles out in terms of temperature and equalization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, uh, that's a little quicker. Yes. Do I, is there a lot of processing on the back end of that? We, as with all science, you sometimes get the right measurement the very first time you develop the experiment. Mm -hmm. But then to do all the other measurements you need to do to tease out the variables that you inadvertently controlled for in your first measurement takes a lot of time. Uh, so we did all that and we finally can distill it down to a very simple mathematical equation. So you make the measurement, you apply an equation. The equation is not empirically fit. It's not something like a bunch of parameters that somebody decided upon mm -hmm. based on fundamental scientific principles. And the only thing we really need to know is temperature. Um, but it's even then, it's not critical for some of the, some aspects of the measurement. This isn't practically speaking going to be something where you could go and review a cafe with a device and be like, "This coffee is good," or could you? So what the device will allow you to do is it'll allow you to make a measurement of composition, but the level of fidelity that we talked about earlier of what makes quality mm -hmm. is not dependent necessarily on the populations of the Molecule, the large populations of molecules, but usually right. it's minor fluctuations and things that are below that of the detection limit of the device. Yeah, your tongue's very sensitive, mm -hmm. and so you're going to be able to taste fluctuations in those the sort of lesser family of molecules. Why the device is useful is because it tells you then something about the polarity or types of molecules mm -hmm. that have made their way into the cup. So you can make this measurement. The problem with just relying on the measurement without thinking about taste is that it doesn't actually tell you how the cup tastes. It just tells you whether that cup has this family of molecules in it or not. Right. So if I tasted the coffee at one cafe and I went to another cafe and had exactly the same coffee, I would still not be able to tell you objectively that they were this, the same or different in flavor. Mm -hmm. But within one cafe doing one protocol, right. I would then be able to tell you whether they were achieving the target, right. which for me is actually more valuable because I think there's a focus on, or too much of a focus on going after what molecules gave rise to a flavor. Right. But next year, when we don't have uh, El Tucan as the best coffee in the world and instead have something else right. that has a different composition, why would we focus so much on something we can't really even control. Mm -hmm. So why not be able to make a general measurement? Back to this paper, just yes, quickly at the end. Is there this. anything we haven't discussed that you wanted to talk about with it? Is there a key thing that we have not picked up on? One of the variables that we controlled for in this paper was roasting. I'm not a roaster. I did my very best to try and use roast profiles and match that of the coffee industry, perhaps how people sample roast in the industry. But I would encourage people to think about how roast profile impacts the charging because you may get a different charging regime off of a coffee on a Loring compared to that of a Giesen or a whatever, a Stronghold, whatever, right? And that's because it, we think that charging is related not only to color, but also internal moisture content after the roast. And those two things depend on how you got there. Right. So that's something that's we tried to control for by not roasting only not only roasting but also sourcing industry industry roast coffees right but it's not going to get to the point where roasters are going to be like hey this is my low charge coffee and you should buy this because it's low charge or maybe i've actually advocated for something slightly different to that okay i would like to see coffee priced on solubility okay so if if your coffee was you know dollar per soluble gram that would be a more interesting pricing method because it would incentivize excellence in roasting or then you'd make the decision oh well it's not not all that soluble but it's high quality and then that, that's what you're paying for then right which is really actually what you're drinking is the soluble gram you can measure the soluble soluble gram right, right. but i think what's more interesting is imagine a roaster says oh yeah this is 20 percent soluble and tastes good and you're gonna get you know 
rhubarb and blueberry at 20%. Mm -hmm. If you go to 21%, you're not going to get rhubarb and blueberry anymore. You're going to see something else, yeah. which is already what happens. Mm -hmm. It's just that we're not pricing it based on soluble gram. Yeah, then we'll start hydrolyzing the stuff down so we can get a bit more yield. And Maybe, that. but then the quality will go down. Sure. Well, this is true. But yeah, it's a, then, then it would also it would feed into this I general idea of sustainability, which is what this paper really is addressing. Which is, can we use less coffee and get more out of the amount that we actually use. And if you right. form this mega aggregate, you're not getting the water penetrating all of the coffee equally, so you're gonna be leaving material behind, which is why you see extraction yields going down, TDS going down, quality going, tending towards the flavors of over extraction, but right. the shot ran faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, is, this addresses that. So it's hard, to, it's hard to imagine all of the examples where you could try and do the experiments, but I think people will probably pursue it themselves. One last question. Can I, can I call them electro clumps? Electro clumps. Well, they're not electric, they're not electrified anymore. Oh. So you're, you're basically going to say when, when you grind coffee, you produce fines and boulders. Yeah. And if you don't de-electrify, they will exit the grind chamber as an electro clump. Yeah. Because that's a specific type of clump. Sounds good to me. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right, I'll wrap it up here for the recording. Thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate you coming to talk to me about all of this. Great work. Thanks.